Awesome. Thanks for those announcements there, Yuri, and welcome everybody to this All Deposits Hub talk in the evening. Um, I want to just put a, a special um, sort of spin on those announcements. And we just hit four and a half thousand YouTube subscribers and the number's growing each day. I really hope we can push to 5,000. So if you know anyone who would be interested in any of these talks, make sure you spread the word around because we want to hit 5K before the end of the year. But enough of that, because I'm about to introduce today's speaker. So today I have the great pleasure to introduce one of my top said hosted specialists, Ali Jaffrey, who is the CEO of US-based Applied Stratigraphics and has 22 years of sedimentology and stratigraphy experience. He has shared his experience working on projects around the world, covering all continents from the USA, from well, multiple countries, basically, Norway, Angola, Kazakhstan, New Zealand, Mozambique. He's been everywhere. Ali has taken specialization in sediment hosted metals and salts. He has trained over 500 geologists and engineers from more than 50 countries. Um, in fact, Philippa, who will probably be in the meeting somewhere, was actually one of those 500 fortunate people and had the possibility of training with Ali. So over the next 30 minutes, you get to hear Ali speak about vanadium and uranium deposits. And with all that being said, the stage is yours, Ali. Thank you so much, Jamie. I appreciate it. That's quite the, it's quite the introduction. I got, I got a lot of, I got a lot to live up to today. No pressure, huh? So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ore Deposits Hub for inviting me. I, I was in touch with Neil, then Aaron, Philippa, and then Jamie. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do this for you guys. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the plan today is to talk about the Colorado Plateau model. Now, there is a slight lag time of about 10 seconds, and that's, you know, that's pretty common with Zoom, so you'd have to excuse that. But uh, the plan is we're going to start talking about the Colorado Plateau type model, which I'm not a fan of. You're going to find that out pretty quick. We're going to then talk about a much better approach to sediment-hosted metals, which is a mineral systems approach, and that's what we'll do. And no one's ever done that before for sediment-hosted uranium and vanadium, especially for Colorado. So that'll hopefully that'll be something useful to all those who are exploring for these deposits elsewhere in the world. I'll, I have a quick slide on recommendations and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So with that, let's talk about what the Colorado Plateau model is. So the model has been around for a long time. And when I say a long time, we're talking about since the 1940s. In the 1940s, the U.S. initiated what was called the Manhattan Project. In fact, it was initiated long, even before the 1940s, but that was the basic idea to come up with uh, the atomic bomb. And what the U.S. did was it actually set up several stations, almost like your local post office, where you could just come by and drop off uranium ore. So all these ranchers and farmers across the desert Southwest would just show up and they would bring whatever uranium they could find on their property and then they'd get, ca get cash for it. And it actually started a uranium boom in the 1940s, almost like a gold rush of sorts. And with that, of course, a lot of geologists got involved and they started what's called the Colorado Plateau model of how uranium is hosted in these rocks. And perhaps you'll see this, you know, you hear about uranium roll fronts, people think roll fronts, they think about Colorado, the Colorado Plateau model. And, you know, people were just so focused on mining this stuff as quickly as possible in this nuclear arms race that there wasn't, a, there wasn't too much science that was going into it. And a lot of this stuff happened before the 1970s. In the 1970s, there was a huge crash. You know, of course, the price of uranium fluctuates with how the public feels about uranium. And so there was a huge crash in the 1970s. You know, Chernobyl happened, Six Mile Island happened, then Fukushima happened. Large deposits were discovered elsewhere in the world, like Kazakhstan and Canada. And the reason I'm getting into this is because a lot of the important techniques 
in fluvial sedimentology and stratigraphy actually didn't come around until the late 1970s and 80s. So it was almost like there was no overlap. Okay, and as a result, we've got some pretty silly models that are out there. Here, here's an example. You can see an example right here. And you can see that pretty, in all of these models, the one thing they have in common is you'll see this black blob is supposed to be uranium ore. And I should say vanadium and uranium ore. And it's kind of just floating around in these sandstones right in the middle of the, of the sandstone. And if you talk to people about what the Colorado Plateau model is, they'll tell you, well, it's basically vanadium and uranium occurring together in these super coarse grained conglomeratic sandstones. And they're all in these channel sandstones and they're kind of floating around and they're like that, okay? So like I said, it's, it's, the idea is a bit silly, but you know, why do people use this model? Well, it's because these four states, the states of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, which are in the United States, they're, you know, they produced together, they produce about over 50 million tons of uranium ore, which is why people refer to the Colorado Plateau model. And they use it as an exploration tool for other parts of the world, especially if they think these minerals are gonna be hosted in fluvial deposits. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the rationale for doing so. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you, having lived in Colorado for 22 years, I spent about 100 days in the field every year. And most of those days are spent doing field work on rocks in the Colorado Plateau model. The first thing I'm gonna tell you is you need to ditch the model, man. That's just a, the sooner you can ditch it, the better off you'll be. I mean, we're in the year 2021. So I think this whole idea of Colorado type model and the Carlin type model, and you know, it's just, um, it's just, you're not really my type model. It, these things have got to go. It's just, it's just not the time and place for it. And I think it's time we moved on to taking a systematic mineral systems approach. And that's what I've tried to do in this talk for you. So for those of you who are not very familiar with the mineral systems approach, it's, it's sort of similar to what people do in oil and gas, such as we're gonna talk about the source of the metal. We're gonna talk about migration pathways. We're gonna talk about what it takes to finally deposit and concentrate the model uh, the metal such that it's economic, okay? From background crustal abundance to whatever grade we need for it to be economic. So as far as the Colorado Plateau goes, we're gonna, we're gonna break this thing down. So we're gonna start with the source, then focus on the trapping mechanism, talk a little bit about the source rock. So whatever I'm talking to you about you know, is based on some of the work that was done by my mentors. I was, I've been very lucky to be trained by some of the best guys out there who devoted their entire careers to vanadium and uranium exploration. This includes uh, Bill Boberg and uh, Tony Kofschak. But all the numbers that you see on here, this is a map of the four states. So here's the state of Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. We lumped them together into the Colorado Plateau, just because the stratigraphy is pretty similar between these four states. To give you a sense of scale, here's a, the scale bar that's about 500 kilometers right there. And when you're looking at the map, uh, north is straight up. So let's look at the stratigraphy here. Today, we're gonna to be talking about mainly the Triassic and the Jurassic and a little bit of the Cretaceous. Okay, there's very little uranium and vanadium in the Cretaceous. Most of it is actually in the Triassic and Jurassic. So the first thing I want you to take away is that the Colorado Plateau model isn't specific to fluvial systems. Okay, that's a, that's a misconception that's out there. So anytime people see uranium and vanadium being hosted by fluvial deposits, they think that is the Colorado Plateau model and that is incorrect. Okay, so yes, I would say 80% of the vanadium and uranium on the Colorado Plateau does come from fluvial deposits but there's also a bunch of vanadium in Aeolian deposits, and then there's a bunch of uranium in carbonates as well. So we're, I'm gonna show you examples of all of those. The districts that I've written, they're not, that's not a, an exhaustive list of all the districts that, are, that have produced these minerals out here, 
But these are the districts where I have done field work for this project, which has been an internal company project for the past two years. And it's about the data that I'm about to show you as from about a hundred different mines. So let's talk about the source of uranium versus vanadium first. So when you're looking at crustal abundances, and we're gonna wait for the slide to, to switch here in a little bit, there is a bit of, of lag, there we go. So crustal abundances are, are fairly low. You know, we're talking about maybe around one, you know, one to two parts per million. You know, in granites, the abundances are a little higher, but that's just not good enough. We need to concentrate this stuff. So in the, at, on the Colorado Plateau, we get to about maybe 10,000 parts per million. So in the Colorado Plateau, that would be high grade for us. Low grade would be a lot less than that, you know, like around 2,500 and maybe 5,000 parts per million. It's nowhere close to what the Canadians are mining, but it's still, this is the stuff that folks have been mining here for the past 100 years or so. So what's the source? Where the source for the uranium tends to be a lot of these ash fall tufts, which are in these fluvial deposits. Here's, an, here's a picture of one of these areas. So that's, a, that's in the brushy basin member, which sits directly on top of the salt wash member where a lot of this vanadium and uranium comes from. But it's the volcanic ashes that are, pro that are providing the source for uranium. The source of the vanadium is actually different. That is actually coming from from granitic rocks and that are close by and the weathering of that, you know, gets the vanadium into the system. The part that's been severely overlooked is how you transport that material. Okay, so there's a bunch of hydrogeological models out there. Again, most of them focus on circulation through porous and permeable sandstones. But the one thing people really haven't looked at is the role of faults and fractures as fluid conduits. And I cannot stress this enough for two different reasons. Reason number one is we need to, be, if you're going to go ahead and explore for vanadium and uranium, it is super important for you to be able to get out there and map these fracture networks. You know, people have a tendency when they're, they're, su they're all about veins, when they're looking at hard rocks, because we're used to, hydrothermal alteration. So they're just so focused on that. And they're like, oh my God, you know, what are the different types of alteration? What are alteration halos? And then you come to sedimentary rocks and you're like, eh, these fluids aren't hot enough to do any sort of alteration. And if they're not hot enough to do any sort of, sort of alteration, why even bother with this whole con? There are no veins, so who cares? Well, you should care because these fractures are super important, uh, which is why I've got this close up view right here. Here's the fracture plane. And you can see the outcrop is actually eroding along these fracture planes, it's splitting apart. And if you look at the fracture plane, the yellow that you see is carnitite, the green that you're looking at is tiuumanite. Lots of bright colors right on the fracture plane, but what happens when you move away from the fracture? When you do, there's no mineralization. This rock here is completely barren, okay? So if I were to put my gamma ray spectrometer or an XRF on this guy right here, yeah, this would be this would be nothing. This would be less than 10 parts per million. And then you get here, and then this would jump up to probably over 5,000 parts per million. Okay, so that's super important to understand. Fractures play a major role. Here's another example. Here, this is the only picture in this presentation that I didn't take. This was a this was from a field trip I, I did last week on um, vanadium and uranium. And uh, one of the field trip participants, Ron Parker, who's a really good geochemist he was on the trip and he took he took that picture but the really uh, the reason i wanted to throw that in there is because a lot of folks that are not used to doing field work in sedimentary successions what they don't realize is that oftentimes when you're out these these outcrops are literally splitting along fracture planes so if you're standing here and you're looking at this outcrop and you're seeing mineralization well guess what that mineralization that you're seeing is not a function of what's inside the matrix, okay? What you're looking at is what was precipitated by fluids migrating along that fracture plane. So the greens that you're seeing in here are again, tiuumanite. There's a little bit of carnitite in there. The whites that, you see, that you're seeing, that's all calcite. And then the reds are iron oxides like hematite and limonite. 
okay? If you were to go and break this outcrop apart, so if I just went here with a sledgehammer and I broke up this face and I would get into the matrix, guess what? There's no uranium in there whatsoever, okay? So that's super important to understand. Now, I told you this whole fracture business is important for two reasons. Number one, because the fractures are conduits for fluid flow. The second reason why this is so important is because this is where those silly diagrams come from, okay? Someone would look at this and be like, oh, there's a channel. I can see the undulating base to this fluvial channel. Here's the uranium. Oh, so this uranium is right in the middle of the channel. Nope, it's not in the middle of the channel. It's right along the fracture plane, okay? So the middle of the channel is not a good spot to go for that uranium. It doesn't, these ore bodies are not floating around in 3D space, okay? So let's talk about a little bit more about the transportation and entrapment of vanadium and uranium. So we're gonna wait for the slide to switch, there we go. So if there's anything you take away from this talk, this is it, okay? This I would say is the most important slide in here today. So what we've got is a EHPH diagram. Now it's very important to know that Vanadium and uranium are moving in different parts of the system and they're being deposited in other parts of the system. Okay, that is super, super under, important to understand. So if there's one thing you can take away, it's that. That yes, you have an entire fluvial system. The fluids that are mobilizing these metals are using one part of the system preferentially and when they precipitate out, it's in a very different part of the system. It's not in the same bodies. So let's talk about mobility. Uranium and vanadium are pretty darn picky in the sense that you need oxidizing fluids to transport them. And you need some very specific values of pH. Okay, so those values for uranium are, are, are a little bit, bit more widespread. They're a bit, you know, approximately between 5 and 10. For vanadium, the, the range is even narrower. It's around between 5.3 to 6.2 or so. So we need this, these fluids, which are essentially meteoric, okay? So it's raining somewhere. This is millions of years after these rocks have been deposited. And there can be several episodes over which this happens, okay? So you've got meteoric fluids that are oxidizing. They have their a pH between five to 10, and they're mobilizing these metals along highly porous permeable sandstones or along fracture planes. These, so these metals keep moving in these fluids until something changes. And what that something is, is either we, going, we go from um, oxidized to reduced conditions, or we have a change in pH, or we have a phase each change, but we need some sort of change. And what ends up happening is those channel sandstones are what the vanadium and uranium are, is transported in, but it is not deposited in the middle of those channel sandstones. In most cases, it's actually deposited in what used to be waterlogged environments of deposition under reduced acidic conditions, okay? So let's talk about those. So what are some places in a fluvial system where you can expect reductants to be preserved? Here's an example, there's a picture I took last week. So here is the Colorado River, okay? And like all rivers, it floods and when it does, we've got waters that settle out in overbank environments, in this case, pretty close to the river channel itself. Okay, you've got rotting vegetation out there. You know, one of the things my mentor, Bill Boberg, did for his graduate work is he went through not the Colorado, but the Platte River, where he was looking at EH values right next to the channel and the sand and the sands along the channel versus some of these more stagnant water bodies, you know, forming ponds and lakes right next to the river. And those EH values were drastically different. Okay, so oxidizing conditions here, reducing conditions here. So this is where we're gonna end up preserving a lot of that reductant, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. What does that stuff look like once it's consolidated? 
Okay, once it's consolidated, you have to remember that organic detritus has almost the same settling velocity as silt. So when you're looking in here, that right there are overbank deposits. Okay, so there's this, this silty mudstone. And in that silty mudstone is a lot of reductant and a result, this forms a precipitation site. You can see all the yellow in here, that's the uranium. And as this fluvial channel on top is eroding into it, it's taking some of those organics and they're being preserved as disseminated organics in there. And again, they could provide a reductant as well. But again, what I want you to take away from this is that a lot of the uranium is actually, and the vanadium is being hosted in these fine grain populations. It's not right in the, in the channel Thalweg. All right, in the ne next slide, you're looking at an ancient point bar. How do we know it's a point bar? We're, we're looking at incline heterolithic stratification. And if you go to a point bar right after a rainstorm, what you'll notice is that as floodwaters are waning, again, one of the last things to settle out are, is organic detritus. So these point bars are covered with leaves and they're covered by pieces of bark and twigs and things like that. Of course, you bury all that stuff, you are providing the reductant needed for vanadium and uranium entrapment. So you're looking at, at this mine right here and all that, this is what the miners used to call organic trash, okay? But that is what's providing the reductant for the vanadium and uranium. Now, what you could possibly do is, depending on what the discharge in the river is like, you can get log jams, which are entire logs that get entrapped in a channel and then they block it. Okay, of course you bury that and that is another site where you can get a high concentration of reductant. And if it, there's a high concentration of reductant, that is a preferential location for vanadium and uranium precipitation. So you're looking at this log right here, the yellows, the yellows that you see are carnitite and also in the background, you can see some green, which is actually malachite, because again, copper loves organic reductants as well. The other misconception a lot of folks have when it comes to uranium on the Colorado Plateau is the thing roll fronts. And yes, there's a few roll fronts, but when I say few, we're talking about maybe less than 10 to 15, okay? In most cases, what we get are rolls, and this is a completely different beast than roll fronts. They don't develop like roll fronts at all, you can see that here, you can see they're, they're cutting, they're actually cutting across stratigraphy. You know, there's a, a lot of people believe, believe they develop like these Lisa gang bands and they've got super fancy hydrologic models to explain their formation. You know, I, I tend to keep things simple. I think the reason why they form the way they do is just because in a lot of these river channels and overbank environments, you've got concentration of organics. And as these things are decomposing and they're giving out organic acids, those organic acids provide a reductant. So years later, when these oxi oxidizing fluids are traveling through these sandstones and they're enriched in vanadium and uranium, as soon as they hit these zones where you have these organic acids, they form halos around them. And that's how you develop these things. But again, they're rolls, they are not roll fronts. Another spot to precipitate uranium are paleosols that develop along the margins of these channels. You, you can see an example right here. Here's a unit bar or, um, or an alternate bar. And you can see it's, it's super vegetated. Along the roots of those, you've got bacterial communities. So that area is, you know, again, the preservation potential of organics is high. And here's an example from right outside a pretty famous mine. And you can see here's a root trace or a rhizoconcretion right there or a rhizolith. And right in there is Tiyuumanite. Okay. And I've I found this I found very similar features in other places where you've got entire rooted zones. And again, that's where the metal concentration is. If you've got channels that are incising into substrates that are organic rich, then of course the lags that are sitting at the base of the channels are also going to be zones where you've, you've picked up these ripple class are made up of organic detritus, organic rich pebbles. 
And later, later on, when you've got fluids mobilizing metals go through, those are sites where you will precipitate the metals out. In this case, it's a, I, I, I really like this example because not only do you have the yellow, which is the carnotite, which is uranium and vanadium, you've got the green, which is tiohumanite, and then the blue that you're looking at here, that is actually azurite. So you've got copper, uranium, and vanadium precipitating out because of the same mechanism. Now, everything I've, I've, I've gone over so far has been specific to fluvial systems. And if you're gonna look at fluvial systems, you need to understand that on the Colorado Plateau, we're talking about two different formations. We're talking about the Triassic Chinle and we're talking about the Jurassic Morrison. And the alluvial architecture for these is very different. And because the alluvial architecture is different, the type of deposits we get are also very different. The Morrison is, is kind of like this. This classification scheme is from Chris Fielding. And uh, this is one that I really like because we're classifying rivers not based on plant form geometry, but based on discharge variance, okay? Which is what are, what are the difference between the highs and the lows? You know, you've got a river in a tropical setting, like maybe think of a river like the Amazon or something in Papua New Guinea or the Congo, where at best, you know, you've got a dry season and a low season. And of course, there's discharge variant, you know, variations between those two seasons, but it's not as drastic as a river, you know, as a dry land river in a place like Ethiopia or New Mexico, or even parts of Australia, dry parts of Australia, where there's no flow in the river most of the year. And then one day you've got a flash flood that just goes through it, okay? So those tropical rivers would be kind of like here, whereas an, an ephemeral stream with flashy discharge would be out here. And when you look at the Morrison, the Morrison kind of falls more in this category. It's dominated by cross, cross sets, whereas the Shimli is more here. It's not as extreme as this image over here, but it's kind of in the middle. As a result, what happens is, in the Morrison, yeah, you've got smaller deposit deposits of vanadium and uranium. And when I say smaller, we're talking about individual mines only producing a couple of hundred tons. But then there's a lot of them, okay? And they're all over the place. But then when you talk about something like the Chinle, because there are log jams there, these, the deposits aren't as common as they are in the Morrison, but when you do find them, they are much higher tonnage. So we're done with fluvial systems. That is what people believe the Colorado Plateau model is. And I'm telling you already, that's, uh, that's BS, uh, bad science. Okay, so don't, when you hear Colorado Plateau, you shouldn't only think about fluvial deposits because there's other types of deposits as well. And here's an example. So this right here is at the Jurassic Entrada Sandstone. And for most geologists, who visited the US, you know, they, everyone likes to go to Moab, people like to go to Arches National Park, and here's Delicate Arch, and it's made up of the Entrada Sandstone. So most people are at least, who have not been to the US are at least familiar with that image. And when you look at the Delicate Arch, I think that one of the most striking features is the color of the arch, how you have these bright orange to red sandstones. But then you look at the Entrada at this particular location, which is in Colorado, and it is, missing those oranges and reds. It's pretty much white. And the reason it looks white is because it's been bleached by hydrocarbons that have migrated through. Now, because hydrocarbons have migrated through, a lot of times what happens is they will leave either tiny amounts of hydrogen sulfide in there, or there's times where you have bitumen still left behind, still preserved in that sandstone. And like I said, vanadium and uranium have an affinity for organics. So right underneath this, you can see these bright red colored mudstones and sandstones. This is a different formation. So what happens is we've got falls, vanadium bearing fluids will migrate along the falls. They'll go through the oxidizing, oxidized stuff. And right here at the redox cline, this is where they're gonna get precipitated out, okay? Here's a close up of those deposits of what they look like. As soon as the slide changes, 
All right, so like I said, sometimes the lag, the lag between uh, me changing the slide and it happening is a little longer. Again, the yellows that you're seeing, that is carnitite. Okay, the black that you're seeing right here, okay, that is, that is the vanadium in the rock, okay? And again, these things are right there at the redox line. So eolianites are part of the system. We're gonna talk about carbonates briefly because this is one of the few places in the world where you get carbonate hosted uranium. So I think we should make a big deal about it. And uh, they are part of the Colorado Plateau system. So the carbonates that the uranium is being hosted in, this is in New Mexico, it's called uh, the Tadilto limestone is Jurassic in age. And uh, these are lacustrine carbonates. And not only are they lacustrine carbonates, these are microbialized. So they were created by bacterial activity. Now, until 10, 15 years ago, we really didn't have a good handle on lacustrine microbial carbonates until large volumes of hydrocarbons were discovered in offshore Brazil from Cretaceous lacustrine carbonates. And then everyone went crazy and there was a lot of research that's been done. And now we have a really good handle on what these things look like and what their facies belts are like. So in this picture right here, the, the reddish sandstones you see, those are, that's the Entrada sandstone again, okay? And there you can see original depositional topography preserved. So you've got these Aeolian deposits that were flooded and you have a lake and along the margins of the lake, you have these carbonate buildups. Okay, so the gray that you see, those are all carbonates, but again, not all carbonates are the same. Okay, so the organic content of these carbonates depends upon water depth, energy, nutrient availability. So you have distinct facies belts of these carbonates growing along the margins of these lakes. So here's an example of the facies that is not so good, okay? Why is that not so good? You can see we are looking at a TP structure right here and it's created as carb because of contraction, because there's a lot of evaporite precipitation along with these carbonates, okay? So there's a space problem and then things kind of buckle up and you get these TPs and uh, that's what you're looking at. Okay, so this is the, this is, these are carbonates, again in the Tadilto. There's a little bit of uranium in here, why? Because there's a little bit of organics, so there's a little bit of reductant, but the, you know, that's not what we want. We don't want a little bit, we want a lot. So you move on to the next facies belt, and that's when you see things getting a lot better. Okay, so in the next picture, you can see my scintillometer for scale, and the green that you see it's Taiyu Yamanite, okay? So, and where is that? That's being precipitated, again, in zones where you have higher organic content, okay? So, area, so it's all laminated, okay? And right along the bedding planes is where you find the uranium mineralization. So what I, what I recommend for anyone who is interested in pursuing, you know, you're doing, if you're doing any sort of exploration for vanadium or uranium deposits in, you know, in sedimentary rocks, the first thing I recommend is, man, it's the year 2021. So you can't, you know, you can't always take the same techniques that you apply in hard rocks. So it just can't, be. You know, mining to most people is a marriage of geochemistry and structural geology. And then people have the same ideas when they come to sedimentary successions. And I'm not, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use structural geology. In fact, you know, like I said, I'm a huge fan of understanding fracture networks in these sedimentary successions. You should definitely still do your geochemistry, but I think you really need to develop a thorough understanding of fluvial sedimentology and stratigraphy for fluvial successions. If you're doing this in carbonates, again, you need to have a thorough understanding of how carbonate set, set strat works along with paleoecology. And again, for fluvial successions, it's super important to understand plant taphonomy as well. If you don't know what taphonomy is, that's just after, you know, what, what factors contribute to the preservation of these plant, of plant matter 
you know, what these concentrations are like, whether they're logs, whether it's leaf litter, how is it preserved? All that stuff is very important if you want to be able to predict metal occurrence. And that's not, that's not just true for vanadium and uranium. This goes, this is across the board for any metal that you're going to be exploring for in sedimentary successions. And then finally, you know, our, our standard practice of core description in the mining industry, it's again, very geared towards, you know, metamorphic igneous rocks. You know, it's very geared towards finding alteration. But when you're gonna do this for sedimentary successions, you know, there's a reason folks in the oil and gas business do this on a centimeter scale instead of, sample, instead of describing core on a meter and a half scale. Okay, there's a, there's a big difference, again, because they're after those finer details that actually matter. So this is an example, the, in the background is a picture. This is an exercise we did, we do out on our field trips where I'm having this guy log this outcrop using a scintillometer. They're gonna create a gamma ray profile in counts per second. And then they're gonna go ahead and describe the outcrop on a centimeter scale, just so you get a sense of how much detail you would miss if you were actually doing it the way most mining companies do, which is logging this at a meter to a meter and a half scale. Okay, you're gonna miss out on the thickness of cross beds. If you didn't know what the thickness of cross beds is, you can't figure out what the dimensions of these channels are, the dimensions of channel bells, sinuosity, things like that. And um, same goes for, for non-classics. So if you're looking, working on carbonates, same things apply there. So I think I've gone a little over time, but I, I hope what you got was, was somewhat useful in uh, whatever you were planning on doing, whether it's sediment hosted, uranium, vanadium, copper, or some other metal. Thank you. Um, I'll wait a little bit of time for those questions to come in. Um, so what I'll do um, is I'll kick off with a question of my own, Ali. Um, sure. So I did write a few down, but essentially, you know, you mentioned about faults and fractures being really important. Um, and this is something we see all the time as well in sort of sediment hosted copper systems. Um, and one of the uh, photos, obviously you showed one side of the fracture being mineralized than the other. And I couldn't work out which way was the hanging wall or the foot wall. So I was just wondering in general, do you tend to see one side of the fault um, mineralized over the other? And in which case, which way around do you normally see that? That's a, that's a very good question. Let me, let me go back to that slide. So in this case, what you're looking at is not a shear fracture, but in a tension fracture. So in this case, the movement, there's, there's no shear component to it. And because there's no shear component to it, there is no hanging wall or foot wall. It's just that you've got a fracture like this, and then the outcrop is just splitting right along it. So it's more of a joint than a fault. Okay, I'm just waiting, ah, yeah, this one exactly. So this is not a, a fault per se, this is just a, a tension fracture. This is just a tension fracture. And uh, and that's what, I, I've seen that a lot. I've seen that a lot in that uh, they don't need to be shear fractures. Uh, a lot of the mineralization happens along tension fractures. So there's, a, there's two more examples in here. So one of them you can't see too well because I've written in front of it, but I'll see if I can go back there. Yeah, I'll wait for the, the slides yeah. to catch yeah. up. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so in this outcrop, the the purple purplish maroon colors that you see back here, that is uh, the vanadium mineral montrosite. And then again, you can see some very large crystals of calcite right here. So again, this thing mm -hmm. right here is a fracture plane. It's again, a tension fracture. Things have just sloughed off. But before things sloughed off and when this, fra this fracture was actually, fluids were moving actively through it, that's when this stuff was being deposited. So as far as, you know, the hanging wall or foot wall, either of those preferentially having more mineralization, I've actually never seen that because most of the time, uh, the, the mineralization I've seen when it comes to vanadium and uranium, it's been in tension fractures. Okay, no worries. Um, so I think we've had a couple of questions in the chat now. So uh, the first question is from somebody called, I, I really apologize if I butcher any of your guys' names, by the way. Um, but the first question is from, I think, Hossein Judah. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Hossein, and ask a question yourself, feel free to do so. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, uh, hey Ali. Hey, Hussein, how you doing? Yeah, thank you so much. So far, so good. Yeah, I have this question I posted. So I find some uh, level in uh, Tassili Najjar Plateau in south of uh, uh, Algeria. And I didn't pay attention more to this level. And you see the characteristic is so much in uh, so rich in zircons and as well in gamma ray field gamma ray, it's quite high. Right. And I thought, yeah, and I thought if there is some kind of suggestion from you as a prospect or something to do more, on, especially on this level. You know, so Hossein, so, so the first thing I would do is since you do have an XRF and you're out there, uh, what I would do is instead, you know, why don't you just look at parts per million off the uranium itself? Okay, so if you've got anything over 5,000 parts per million, that's, that's fairly decent. If you've got something that's over 10,000 parts per million, that is actually worth chasing. Okay. Okay, so another question, and I'm apologizing for uh, probably misreading the name too. From Hryer, uh, do you want to unmute yourself or I can read the question for you? That's a difficult uh, question. If the Yes, so <laughs> the question is, if the uranium vanadium mineralization is concentrated along the fractures, then how can you estimate the volume of the mineralization? Yeah, that's an excellent question, man. So what I, in that case, uh, the, the first thing I would do is I would focus on the fracture density, the fract, which is basically you can do it vertically, depending on the orientation of the fractures. You can also do it horizontally, which is, you know, how many fractures, fractures per meter are you getting? Okay, so you would, you would focus on the fracture density. And uh, the other thing you would want to see is, well, what is, how, what is the homogeneity of the mineralization along those fracture planes. Does it come and go? Does it stay consistent? So there's a lot of different things in there. And then what you would do is you would actually do fracture modeling and the fracture modeling would allow you to calculate volumetrics. And also a following question, uh, I guess from me. Um, so this convenient location of mineralization along the fracture, is it used for extraction of the uranium and vanadium? Like uh, mobilizing it with the fluids and then extracting it from it? Yeah, so, so Yuri, what, what, you know, the thing is, like I said, this, a lot of this, these mines that I've showed you pictures from, the most of them were abandoned here in the, the 1970s, okay? So earlier 1970s is when they got abandoned. And that is not when people had developed a thorough understanding of fluid flow through fractures, especially when it comes to sediment hosted metals. So what folks would assume is like on this outcrop right here, when they saw the mineralization, they didn't even consider the fact that the mineralization was confined to the structure plane. They would see this and they would start mining into the rock face horizontally, assuming they would keep seeing this mineralization. And uh, so that was, uh, that's what folks used to do. Yeah, but for me, it seems like right now there are some plenty of techniques that can be used to actually oh, yeah. extract yeah. the mineralization without changing the outcome. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Now we have those techniques. Unfortunately, when this stuff was mined, they didn't. And right now mm -hmm. with current prices of uranium and vanadium uh, and the environmental laws in the U.S., they, it would be very, very difficult to go back to some of these deposits and mine them. But a great question though. Awesome. So uh, we do have another, well, I'm going to say set of questions in the chat from someone. Um, again, apologies if I butcher your name, uh, but Bivan Goes, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, certainly. Um, very nice talk. I've been out there, um, not and recently, actually. Uh, uh, but my first question is in the Colorado Plateau stratigraphy, um, where do where do the weathered granitic sediments sit? And those would presumably be the source of the vanadium. So those are actually below. So, so if, you've, if you've been here, I'm assuming, you know, if, if you're familiar, for example, with the, with the geology around uh, Colorado National Monument, that's the basement. And uh, right, right. the chimney sits directly on top of the basement. There it does, but I yeah. mean, out here, further into the uh, basins. How far down are we 
are the granitic uh, rocks should be thousands of feet. Yeah, and, and a lot of times there are there are you know there are certain situations where they can be thousands of feet. Uh, and uh, but the ash the the uranium is being sourced by ash beds which are actually in the brushy can in the brushy basin which is right above the salt wash. Okay. So that's where the uranium is coming from. So the Jurassic 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 Triassic out here is really the source of the uranium. Yes. Yeah. Out in, for instance, where this picture is taken. Exactly. Right. And then do the fluids, the oxidizing fluids following fracture networks, are they, can they go up the fractures, down the fractures, or both? They do, they do both, and they do so in multiple episodes. I saw that there is a, that's the next part to your, to your question. So depending on where you happen to be, uh, for example, in the grants area, there's a lot of work that the USGS did out there, and they found out that there's actually three distinct episodes of uranium and vanadium mineralization that happened. So the first one happening in the Cretaceous, and then the last one was probably, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was the late Oligocene, early Miocene. Mm -hmm. And so really the laramide fracturing is what controls the ores? I think a, a lot, some, of, some of it is uh, laramide fracturing, and then some of it is just tectonic unloading over the years. So okay. the later episodes where these fluids were moving were through fractures that happened. Because like I said, a lot of these happen to be just, just distension fractures. Right. So some of it could be rather young. Exactly. Exactly. Remobilized. Um, oh, this is an aside. I work for the USGS. Um, oh, good. Um, good. Are sorry, you in Denver? Yeah, I'm at the Federal Center. Okay, great. Right. And since the mid '80s, I've been trying to wrap my mind around the breccia pipe deposits in the Grand Canyon region. Well, but yeah, I, I hope you know this. The the lady, I'm, I'm, I always forget her name. Uh, I have her business card upstairs. She's part of the Denver Mining Club, and Karen she, Henrik. yeah, yeah. So she's in yeah. town. I think she'd be a good person to get out there with. I worked with her for several years. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. But. Uh, yeah, that's a whole nother ball game, I'm afraid. Yeah, oh but yeah. But the right. source of uranium might be the same. Right. And a regional, but they're very bizarre host structures. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've, I've never had a chance to get down there yet. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, no, you're welcome. Awesome. Thanks for those questions, by the way, um, because some of those were very similar to some questions I had wrote down. Um, and on that topic of the younger stuff, um, you know, I often, in, in again, in, in Zambia, the DRC, um, you have uranium deposits there. Um, but one of the other things you get, in, I guess it forms in a sort of similar way, um, is you get these oxidized cobalt caps, mm -hmm. which I think are all being deposited. It's all super gene. It's all really, really young. And I think that's where the sort of younger unloading, where those you know modern day meteoric fluids can come down and essentially remobilize the old material. So would you say that a lot of the uranium that's younger is just remobilization of the older stuff? There's there's definitely remobilization that's happened, and uh, like I said, the the folks at the USGS and in, in the in New Mexico have done some work on remobilization and really figured out when you know, when these deposits, these younger deposits form. So yes, yes, it, it does happen. It's not as drastic. I've noticed it's not as drastic as it is in some of the sediment hosted copper deposits, but it's, yeah, there, there is, there is a little, there is some remobilization, definitely. Okay, so uh, we have a question in chat from Darcy here's the form. Do you want to ask this, Darcy, do you want to ask this question yourself? Yeah, sure. It's just interesting for me because um, I've seen, I've been down to that area and on field trips. And, and one thing that struck me about the, the arc of your conversation was those joints are obviously important. And, and what made me kind of twig onto that to a degree was the Makazani Plateau deposits in Peru, where uh, they're volcanic hosted, but they're very young. Uh, and Valeria Lee's uh, PhD thesis at Queen's University, she discusses some of this where uh, they are quite joint controlled because the, the volcanics are quite isotropic, like they're quite uh, consistent. And so it ends up being controlled by 
uh, you know, basically fluvial conditions and, and joints uh, in the area. Is, is the amount of control basically a function of how continuous the sedimentary units are uh, and, and their organic content? So like are the joints more important in cases where you don't have as maybe as much focus of the organics and it's more related to, to fluvial conditions or like the joint conditions rather than that or is there a combination of both? It's actually a combination of both. So let me, let me just draw this out for you. So if you would have a situation like this, let me just... It's going to take a little bit for my slide to change. So let's uh, let's draw these fracture networks in red. So you can see I've just drawn them. They're equally spaced. And let's assume there's some reductant right here. And there's some reductant right there. So where you're going to get the the uranium precipitation will then be right here. So even though you can say that, see that there's at least one, two, I've drawn four different sets for you. You're only gonna get them where you've got oxidizing fluids, mobilizing the metals until they meet the reductant and that's where the precipitation happens. So the, it's gotta be a combination. So, so when you're mapping on, on outcrop scales, uh, you, you know, the argument would be that you're presenting is that the joints are something that could be done through satellite imagery or things like that, where you can kind of track joint structures. But uh, that level of mapping of the channel systems and, and plant taphonomies and everything like that is something that is going to be tougher to overlay. Uh, it's maybe harder to interpret from superficial exposures, but that if planning an exploration program, you might want to actually take that into account to say, well, I need to, I'm going to need in three dimensions to understand uh, where those channel systems are developing a, a bit more than just doing the structural analysis. Most definitely. And, and of course, you know, we didn't, uh, this is a shorter talk and, and I didn't have the time to get into it, but one of the, another talk that I give is specifically on the fluvial systems. And there's a lot of good work that's being done by Adrian Hartley and Amanda Owen on some of these from large scale, the basin scale, or, you know, from a mining perspective, that would be the district scale distribution of these uh, of these ore bodies. And a lot of it is controlled by large scale alluvial architecture. So I think the best thing to do would be you'd have to have three overlays. You'd have to have one overlay showing large scale alluvial architecture. You'd have to have a second overlay, which shows places that are more conducive to reductant preservation. And then the third thing would be a fracture map that you could get from satellite imagery and overlay on top of that. And those are the three things that I would put together if I were doing greenfield exploration. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. So unless there are any further questions, Uri, are, are we good to are we good to close? I think I think we are. Well, in that situation then, I'd like to thank Ali for giving so much of your time today. I know you're busy with your, with your business and things like that. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for asking questions. I'd like to thank Yuri for stepping in to do the hosting with me as well. Um, and yeah, um, there was another talk earlier um, by a lady called Isabel Chan before. If you want to go watch that at the end of the week as well, that will also be up. Um, other than that, though, I wish everybody a good evening or, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, and thanks very much for attending. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.